Hi, I'm Liz Hadley. I'm a professor at Stanford University, and I'm here to tell you about some of the work that my lab, have been, uh, my lab and I have been working on for the last several decades. So by training, I'm a paleontologist, which means that I go back in time and study how different animals have been affected by changing environments of the past. Those environmental changes include climate change, they include volcanic eruptions, and they include dispersal between continents. What I'm here to tell you about today is that increasingly I've learned that what's happening on the planet now is essentially equivalent to the kinds of changes that I've been looking at in the fossil record. The biggest reason why these things are happening is that the world population is, is enormous and it's continuing to grow. Um, if we manage somehow to hold our, our population to just replacing every man and woman with another man and woman, we will, still, uh, we will still reach 9 billion people by the year 2045. And that means trouble for other animals on the planet. As a matter of fact, world population growth has really contributed to our colonization of the planet. As humans expanded out of Africa somewhere between 100 and 200,000 years ago, they colonized Australia, they colonized Asia, they colonized Europe, and last of all, they colonized the Americas. Um, so by about 13,000 years ago, humans had reached every continent except uh, Antarctica. So this expansion was also tied to uh, to extinctions of large animals. So we call this the late Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. And in addition to the loss of these animals, for example, all of which were present in North America uh, until about 10,000 years ago, um, there was also a climate warming event. So not only the expansion of humans, but also this climate change that happened at the same time. Turns out those are exactly the same two features that are affecting uh, the planet today. Humans, in fact, have been killing, deliberately killing wildlife for thousands of years. Um, and through that, that expansion out of Africa, it turns out that every continent lost their large animals, not just North America. What you see here are bar graphs of just the number of species in different size categories. So over here are the smaller animals, and over here are the larger animals. In Africa, it's really the only continent that maintained most of the large animals, like we see these elephants today. Um, whereas in North America and the other continents lost their megafauna, lost their large animals. These elephants know, now are threatened with extinction as well. They have a gestation time of 22 months, and on, on average, one elephant is killed every 15 minutes. There's no way that this large, uh, slow metabolism animal could actually keep, keep up with the deliberate um, uh, slaughter of these animals. We're much, much better at killing uh, wildlife. As a matter of fact, we specialize in going after the very last of some of these um, exquisite animals. So among about 5,500 mammal species, almost a quarter of them are threatened, and most of them are threatened with, deliberately with hunting. But there's more, more than that. Humans, it turns out, and our commensal animals, cows, horses, and sheep, are actually, they dominate the biomass of the planet. So these are uh, to scale in terms of the number of individuals and their body mass. So you see humans here and our livestock and pets. Wild animals, on the other hand, have just a tiny proportion of the total uh, biomass that dominates the planet today. So that means there's little room for these wild animals because we consume most of the energy on the planet. The other thing that's happening is climate's changing. So this is a, a, a diagram of climate change over the last five million years. And you'll note they're changing scales as we go here. It's the million years and thousands of years, and then just the number of years uh, be before present. And then we finally move into the future over here. So what you'll see is that in the last five million years, the climates we're about ready to experience within the next 50 to 100 years are warmer than anything we've experienced in our lifetime as species, and that any of the mammal species, for example, that we're used to interacting with on the planet have experienced in their lifetimes. As a matter of fact, in the Western US alone, wildfires have doubled in frequency since 1988, putting many people uh, at risk for losing um, their, their homes. 
Climate's also contributing to actual biome shifts. This is a, a particular X-ray image of the area around Pinnacles National Park showing that, that the trees that are standing there right now are threatened with, with death in the near future. So red, you either see dead or dying trees, and blue here are the only healthy trees in this particular environment. So in just a few years, we're seeing a major shift in where trees are present and where trees are not on, present on the landscape simply because of climate and then the interaction between climate and things like beetles, in particular for trees. We've lost a tremendous amount of forest cover. The rate of loss has slowed down, but that, doesn't, that really doesn't uh, matter in some ways because we've lost the, a very a, a vast amount of many of these uh, forests in uh, in just the last 14 years uh, around the, the world. Humans, in fact, are really good at causing habitat loss. We can just basically go out. This is like hunting for trees. We go out and we we uh, are just take them down. We transform ecosystems in radical ways. This is an image of what. Uh, New York used to look like before we actually built up the city next to what the place looks like now. And clearly, there's no way for biodiversity, at least most biodiversity, to thrive in an environment that's so human dominated. In fact, if you look at the sum total of the terrestrial land on the planet, we have used and co opted about 51% of the land area just for our use, mostly for uh, production of food for ourselves and our commensal animals. If you look at this, you'll see that the only places that we haven't really uh, occupied and we haven't transformed are the hard-to-reach places, the Sahara Desert, the Congo, the Amazon, two of the places that have the, the, the largest um, uh, tropical forest left in the planet, and the, the boreal forest and the, and the tundra region. So we've take, taken all the easily farmable land in the world. Now we need to basically farm this land we already have co-opted more efficiently um, in order to feed the, the coming mouths. One of the things that matters a lot when you, when you think about how much of the land we've actually changed on the planet is that just by this simple rule, this is one of the fundamental rules in ecology, is that the number of species is a function of the size of the, the place they occupy. This is a rule of island biogeography. And so here what we see across the x-axis is the size of the island. These are islands in uh, the Caribbean. And the number of species on the y-axis. And so the larger the island is, the more species are found on the island. More area means more species. Here you see uh, an image for different continents on the planet and the number of amphibians. So even on a continental scale, we're finding that larger areas mean more species. So when you look at the amount of land we've actually set aside to be protected on the planet, it amounts to only 13% of our land surface. So even though we've co-opted the function of 51%, we've only actively set aside 13% of this to be protected. And areas like Yellowstone National Park, the world's first national park, is, you can see, isolated from all the other uh, protected areas in, in, the, in, the, in North America. So what these patches mean is that we don't have a lot of connectivity between our protected areas. That exacerbates our attempts at conservation. Because animals like to move to, to deal with different environments. As the climates change, they like to move to novel environments. This is Yellowstone National Park, uh, seen from Earth Observatory. And what you see is a very, as a nice long line there showing you the division between the Forest Service land on the west and National Park land on the east. And what you'll see is clear cutting defines now the western border of Yellowstone National Park. This is true for many of the protected areas in the world. There's not a lot of buffer for the animals that want to move away from Yellowstone to a, 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 a part of the, the landscape that they can adjust to. It's not just the transformation of habitat that matters either. It's that our, our transportation system itself has disrupted a lot of these corridors of connection. This slide, which is really spectacular at showing how much of the landscape we've cut up with our transportation, 
uh, shows that in green you see the, the global roads, you see in yellow our, our urban areas, in blue you see our shipping routes, and in white you see our air, air networks. So it's not just on land. It's not just what we've kind of transformed and turned deforestation. It's the roads we've built. It's the number of ships we send across the ocean. And it's the number of planes that fly in the sky, all of which interrupt and threaten animals that need to move across this landscape. Species move to follow their habitats. And they've done this in the past. This is, in fact, one of the first signs of adjusting to climate that we see. On the black dots here you see are data from the Pleistocene showing that, that uh, these animals used to be present greater than 10,000 years ago, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 years ago at these parts of North America. And as climates warmed at the end of the, the, the Pleistocene into what we call the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years, this species, the northern bog lemming, moved to the north. And now you see its range is occupying uh, the orange part of this, this figure. So these species just responded by moving poleward as climates change. This is a very typical response among animals of the world, that they move poleward as climates warm, and they move equatorward as climates cool. In fact, species are already moving north today. There are examples of species interacting with species that don't, they don't normally see. So southern species are now starting to encounter species from northern boreal forest or tundra regions. And there are really interesting and sometimes uh, uh, not very positive interactions that result from those interactions. They create new ecosystems. So these are animals just doing what they need to do and challenging us, too, in thinking about what natural, what pristine, and what we should expect in, in the future. So I already said that animals are on the move. And, and what that means is that they need to find areas that they can colonize where they can live. And it turns out that this fundamental rule of island biogeography that includes more larger area means lar larger number of species, it also includes uh, a, a concept of connectivity. So the closer these islands or these populations are to each other, the more likely they are to maintain more species. So what you see across the x-axis is the number of species present. And this is the rate of ex extinction shown in red and immigration shown in blue. And so when the, when the uh, populations are far from the mainland, there are many fewer species that can be maintained. And when they're close to another uh, a population, they can maintain more species. Likewise, when the island area is small, it maintains very few species compared to when the islands are large. So it's this equilibrium. It's this balance between these rates that really matters. And we have to think about this in moving into the future. So really what that means is biodiversity is threatened even in protected areas. And it's threatened surely by overexploitation, by hunting, deliberate poaching. But it is also threatened by ecosystem transformation. Protected areas don't preserve entire ecosystems. And so the transformation of what's happening outside the protected areas matters to the species that live within it. Novel species are interacting with, with disease and bringing new diseases into places they haven't yet been because they're responding to climate change um, and other sources of environmental transformation. And that means that connectivity between these protected areas is, is very important. So finally, the thing that's really pushing all of this is climate change. And that's what's very important to consider going into the future. Now, one of the things that happens as populations um, get fragmented is that their population size, the animal's population size, starts to decline. And extinction, the loss of a species forever on the planet, is just when population size goes to zero. So here we see amphibians, birds, mammals, and other, many other species. And these are all animals that are threatened somehow with extinction. There are animals shown in black that are ex completely extinct in the wild. There are animals that are shown in these, in these warmer colors that show different kinds of threats to their systems, whether they're imminent, they're facing imminent extinction, or whether their populations are, are threatened. And so all this is to show is that there are many animals, many over th you know, thousands of animals that are threatened with extinction because of population demise. In fact, global population numbers of wildlife are 50% of what they were just in 1970. 
So animals of all types, birds, fish, reptiles, and mammals, are showing really large declines in the number of populations that are on the planet. Just the number of individuals of these species is declined by half. I want to give you an example of what this means. So this is the Iberian lynx. It's found in Spain. And this animal in 1900 was occupied most of Spain. You can see its demise through the 60s, the 80s, and in, uh, in 2010, there's, there are two populations remaining, one with 73 individuals and the other with 173 animal, in, individuals. So not only have we lost populations, and clearly we've lost individuals, we're just down to a couple hundred of these uh, links. And what does that mean? It means that they've gone through what we call a population bottleneck. And I'll explain what that means to the species in just a second. In particular, what we see is that as population size declines, so as we decrease population size, we actually decrease genetic diversity as well. And so in general, the larger the population is, the more genetic diversity will be maintained in that population. And, and why do we care about population diversity? We care about population diversity because that's the toolkit that species have to move into the future. So if we, you know, if we kind of look at this in a little simulated uh, model here, if you think of every one of these marbles, these different colored marbles, marbles as some sort of a genetic diverse, uh, different kinds of uh, a genotype of some sort, if we start with a lot of genetic diversity, and then you just grab a few of these marbles, you're going to get a bottleneck. There's no way you can get all of this diversity if you re decrease the number of marbles you've pulled out of the system. That's called a, a bottleneck. You can recover. You can recover in numbers. You can actually start reproduction of this, of this, uh, of this particular hypothetical species. But you can't recover the initial genetic diversity because it takes so long in evolutionary time to accumulate. So not only are numbers in, of individuals important, it's important to retain those individuals as long as possible to maintain genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is a toolkit for adaptation. Here's a great example. These are the wolves of Isle Royale. They're, they're, they've been studied for over 50 years. It's the longest study of a predator-prey system that we know about. Wolves colonized this island in Lake Superior in the 1940s. And they bounced around. There's a pretty close relationship between wolves and their um, moose prey, um, where there's kind of a dynamic between the two of them. They've, there's been some severe winter declines in moose, and then that affects the, the wolves in some way. There's a, been a particular a, a canine parvovirus that caused a large crash in the number of wolves. And every one of these diamonds shows you that there was a winter bridge to the mainland that wolves could colonize across. And so they, it's continue, the population was continually being rescued. You see now that, that there aren't very many of these colonization events. And, and in fact, the wolves are in decline. And not only are they in decline, because they're, they've, they're losing their genetic diversity, abnormalities in this population have increased dramatically. So for example, these particular uh, abnormalities in their spinal column, in, in Isle Royale, their incidence is about one in every three. And in a normal population, it would just be about 1%. What this means is you can see in this last wolf here of these three, these are the last three wolves remaining on Isle Royale as of 2015. And this last wolf has a shortened tail. It's slightly twisted. And his back, he looks like he has scoliosis. They think that this is the pup of these two, this pair. But these are the last three left. And clearly, this, this wolf is, has been affected uh, by inbreeding. So there is this uh, possibility to rescue populations by bringing in some, some kind of new individuals to a population. And that, indeed, is what happened to the Florida puma. So in uh, the mid-1990s, um, puma were brought in from Texas. And what you see in terms of the population size, which was on decline, is that they basically started breeding more frequently. And so the population really bounced up in individuals. But there was also a rescue of genetic variation. These same, this eight, the eight Texas puma you see before this time 
there's, there's hardly any uh, variation. And after that time, there's an enormous increase in the amount of genetic variation in this population, suggesting that there's been genetic rescue just by adding eight individuals from another healthier population. Small populations, then, to kind of summarize this part, small populations tend to result in inbreeding. And so, and the reason is because it brings out uh, the recessive deleterious genotypes. In this case, you'll see uh, this, this lineage showing uh, this recessive allele that doesn't get expressed in the, the offspring because there's always this dominant allele, this large A, that is overprinting it. When there's inbreeding, you have the opportunity to produce uh, t uh, an individual that has both of these recessive alleles. And what that means is that these deleterious phenotypes then become expressed. Okay, so what are these uh, recessive deleterious alleles? What do they result in? What's the problem with inbreeding? It turns out that the inbreeding creates um, a pretty typical list of problems with, with many animals. Their faces aren't sym symmetrical. They have reduced fertility. And this is true with both in terms of the number of offspring they produce and also whether or not their sperm are even viable. There are many gen genetic disorders, including Down syndrome, that show up in, in animals. They have a much lower birth rate, higher inf infant mortality. And because they have a slow growth rate, they also reach a much smaller adult size. And then most importantly, perhaps, in this changing world is that they really lose a lot of their abilities to respond uh, with their immune system. So uh, I want to point out here is an example in tigers. These are white tigers. White tigers, uh, for those of you who don't know, white tigers are not Siberian. They look like they should be. They have this white coat. It turns out they're completely created in zoos. White tigers are actually Bengal tigers. They're from India. And they've been highly inbred in zoos because people like white tigers. But it turns out the white coat is also associated with um, the, the same gene that creates uh, cross eyes in the individuals. So it crosses the optic nerve. And so every white tiger that you see is cross-eyed. And, and you can see this other tiger here with a severely misformed face and a very asymmetrical face. He has a cleft palate. He has a lot of problems. This animal could not survive in the wild. So to conclude, I just want to really underscore that humans dominate the planet. Populations of wild animals and species of animals are threatened with extinction. They're in decline. What does that matter? Why does that matter? Declining populations lose genetic diversity. They're more likely to lose all those tools that they need to adapt to whatever the future is bringing to us. And then, importantly, the connectivity between these populations, the, the ability for these animals to move and find a new home is increasingly getting more and more difficult. That's critical for their survival. So what I want to do is conclude by saying thank you to all of the former and current members of my lab, all of my collaborators, the funding agencies I've had through the years, and Stanford University.